I'm here with Brian Butler, owner and operator of Brian Butler Media Relations. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much. So today we're talking about uh, some live events and theater um, in Philadelphia. What are some of the um, the immediate impacts uh, that happened to a lot of the shows and uh, things that were planned um, in, in Philadelphia when the pandemic immediately began? Absolutely. So I think it's really important to keep in mind that the live event industry was really one of the first to be impacted by this and most likely will be the last to reopen for a whole variety of reasons. When we go back to March, pretty much everything was put on hold. In particular, arts and entertainment organizations that require large groups to come together to actually produce what they are doing. Since the beginning of March to now, I mean, a variety of things have happened. One, so many of these employees are still out of work. Pandemic unemployment assistance has run out. So all of these individuals, not just the performers, but the administrative folks behind the scenes, designers, technicians, ushers, caterers, electricians, they're all out of work and probably for the foreseeable future. That's number one. Number two, many of these venues, if not all of them, have remained completely dark. So they have no real way to drive income in probably again for the foreseeable future until live events actually start up again. So it's a real perilous time, not only in Philadelphia, but really across the country with this question of how can these organizations proceed and what can be done? Uh, you kind of touched on it already because of the scope of, of all the, the people that uh, this industry touches. But when such an abrupt uh, stop halts to all, all business happens, how does that translate to financial loss for the employees and for the institutions in the city? Absolutely. I think that's a great question. Number one, I think you have to take a look at a couple different things. When we're looking at theater, professional theater in particular, many of these performers are represented by a number of unions. And still to this day, um, these professional unions, and rightfully so, have not come up with clear guidelines as to how they're going to reopen. So you have members involved in these organizations that are really struggling to make ends meet. Uh, two, many of the venues, again, especially here in the States, because there are no government subsidies to help these organizations out or even produce, uh, they're reliant almost strictly on one of two things. One is ticket revenue, right, for your not nonprofits. And for nonprofits, it's ticket revenue and donations. So when you look at, I think, the overall general picture of the economy as a whole, people are not making as many donations as they can. And in particular, if a company is dark and there's no product being produced, there really is no driving force for individuals to make donations or to purchase tickets. There's a few really innovative organizations that have tried to do and are successfully making art and making productions happen in innovative ways that are still driving income in, and they're very lucky in those regards. I think people are looking for that creative sort of way to still be in touch with entertainment, but the vast majority of them, it's a real struggle. Um, in some of the most recent months, we've seen some uh, restrictions sort of start to ease, uh, with, uh, such as uh, capacity limits. Has that sort of helped some shows be able to come back? What does this return look like, if there's any at all? I always kind of laugh, especially this past week, about the news from Philadelphia about the 10% capacity limit. It is something of a joke, and I'll explain why. For a theater, let's say a small house, I'll explain it from a small and large, let's say a small theater around 300 seats. A 10% capacity at max would mean 30 people. 30 people is what it takes to put on a show. Never mind before you start getting audience in. So it makes no fiscal sense for any of these organizations really to even try if you can only get 30 people in the building. I think we might see for some of those smaller houses very creative things, maybe like high-end donors coming for a cabaret with extremely expensive tickets and a very limited um, onstage and backstage crew, but I've not seen anything like that yet. 
a 10% capacity doesn't really help for a smaller thing. Then let's say you look at something larger, let's say the Academy of Music or a venue of that size. Even if you have a venue, let's say that can hold 2,500 folks, 10% is 250. That still doesn't drive fiscally, it doesn't make any sense. Um, by the time you take into account the amount of labor it would take to prepare a space like that, the talent you would have performing on the stage, again, all of the staff to come in and actually staff this sort of an event, um, it doesn't make sense in the States for an organization even to open at 250. When the general public sees something like the Eagles games, now they're letting folks into something like that. I think a lot of times there's confusion. They say, well, why can't these arts organizations or theaters do something like that? Well, one, the stadium is outdoors. That's a whole different animal. And we're talking, you know, a significantly larger venue than, say, even some of the largest theaters in the city. So um, it's really a no-win situation, and understandably so. It's not safe to have more than 10% of a theater in the building at one point. So it's nice to hear that some of these restrictions are lifting, but they really don't make a lot of sense for a lot of companies. Uh, and like so many people who are working at the moment, uh, they're uh, using Zoom and other online resources. Have you seen that um, performers and theaters have been embracing uh, virtual ways to engage with audiences? Absolutely. I think there's some really good examples, and I'll give you two locally that I think really sort of lead the way. One is the Wilma Theater in Philadelphia. Um, really from day one when they realized they were going to have to shut down, they made the commitment to continue to produce what they do, which is very adventurous, interesting art. They've done a couple things. One, they took the final play that was supposed to be part of their season, a play called Is God Is, and they converted it into a radio play that received a lot of acclaim and the equipment was actually delivered to each individual actor's home to record this radio play. They've also done some very innovative things with uh, creating original digital content that's been streamed online. And currently, they actually have a cast in a artist quarantine bubble in the Poconos preparing a site-specific recording of a play called Heroes of the Fourth Turning that will be released digitally come December. Another really good example of a local organization that is really embracing digital arts is Theater Horizon, which is located in Norristown, the county seat in Montgomery County. They just announced a brand new concept called Art Houses, where they are going to team up professional theater makers in the region with households throughout the Montgomery County and Philadelphia County area to create original works based on those household stories that will then be streamed online. The artists will not meet with these folks individually, the households, it'll all be digital and they'll produce this digital piece that will be streamed. It's an interesting way to keep in touch with the community and keep name, you know, keeping the organization's name out there. But it's also a way to really engage individuals who are missing theater right now and creating really innovative new projects. And you're seeing that across the country. There's some amazingly innovative stuff that's happening at a variety of companies. And I think probably for the next year, we're gonna to continue to see this type of work. And uh, finally, jumping off of the uh the uh, expanding capacity limits. Uh, what are some things that um, people in the theater performance and the live events industry would like to see uh, from the state or federal government to support them? Would it be expanding those limits, uh, more aid? What's the best way that they can help them? I think absolutely we need to look at federal level aid for these performance venues. Outside of not only just theaters, live music venues, this is going to, this is an entire industry that's at risk right now. A lot of people see across the seas in Europe, Spain and other countries, there are companies that are actually staging things in full to 250 people in giant opera houses. How are they able to do it? It's government subsidized. The government is assisting these organizations in actually producing things. We don't have systems like that in the States. So I think that's one huge piece of it. Another thing is to look at either bringing back or revising 
pandemic unemployment assistance for those involved in the live arts industries because it's a solid year probably I, I don't think we're going to see theater live music in large venues again till maybe the fall of 2021 and many of these employees are they're really struggling right now and also they're hoping to leave the industry and I can't necessarily blame them. It looks pretty stark right now. So definitely assistance to the organizations that are going to remain dark. And two, definitely assistance to the employees and realizing the huge fiscal impact of the live arts in cities across the nation. Not only, let's say you have a large show coming into play in Philadelphia, you're not only getting ticket revenue into the city, the restaurants all have dinners before or after the show, you have hotel rooms, you have ride shares, parking garages, all that stuff, they're hurting just as much too. So I think we need more public perception as what a live event ultimately does to a town, to a city when it comes in and realize it's a vital economic part of any, uh, any city, any town. All right, Brian Butler, owner and operator at Brian Butler Media Relations. Thank you so much for your time.